This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 808, recorded on September 23rd, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Episode 81, or I should say clinical update number 81, Daniel. My question for today, when do you think 5 to 12-year-olds will be, get vaccinated? You know, that's that's going to be right in my first section on children and COVID, Vincent. All right. So I feel like you've preempted it, but let's, well, go. Let's, let's get going and we'll get right there. So I will start off with a quotation. Uh, no pessimist ever discovered the secret of the stars or sailed to an uncharted land or opened a new doorway for the human spirit. And that is Helen Keller. Um, and actually, the Helen Keller Institute is just down the road from me prior to the pandemic, prior to me slipping on a wet surface and, and tearing the uh, lateral medial meniscus in my left knee. Um, my family and I would all do the Helen Keller fundraiser yearly run. So uh, maybe at some point when I can free up some time in my schedule to fix that knee, I'll be doing that again. But uh, what an inspirational um, woman. Um, far as an update, um, you know, people, um, it, it's so regional in our, in our country. It's so regional in the world, right? What's been happening. Um, we, we are seeing things get a little bit better, um, particularly here in, in the New York area. Um, you know, part of, part of what I tell people when they ask me, they say there's only so many people that can get infected or vaccinated. So, um, there is, you know, there is that, um, but let's get right into, uh, children because we have some I'm going to say exciting um, things on the horizon or that we're hearing here. Um, and I think finally people have come to realize that children are at risk for COVID. I think that's just sort of black and white. Um, that was really a bit of a mistake and, and it's unfortunate. Um, you know, if we've seen, we're still seeing about a quarter million children a week get infected. Um, we're seeing thousands of children end up in the hospital. Um, we're seeing um, a number of children die every week here in the U.S. and worldwide that continues. Um, you know, I've talked about resources in the past. Not only can you go to um, the AAP site, not only can you go to the special CDC pediatric data, I'm going I'm to throw another site at you, and this is COVIDnet, and this is at gis.cdc. Gov. Um, and here you can actually break down um, by age what is going on um, with regard to different things, particularly hospitalizations. It, it's a bit disturbing when you look at the, the rate of hospitalization per 100,000 broken down by individuals under 18. And the highest is in the zero to four. Really, really disturbing. Uh, the youngest children are being impacted. So um, we're going to talk about a couple things today about what might be done to help those individuals. Um, and saying that, we're going to talk first about children, people aged 5 to 12. Um, so straight to vaccines for 5 to 12. So on Monday, September 20th at 6.45 a.m., I think everyone, you got to get up at 6.44 and be ready for these headlines. We saw the press release from Pfizer with the headline, Pfizer and Biotech announced positive top-line results from pivotal trial of COVID-19 vaccine in children 5 to 11 years. Um, and so Pfizer and BioNTech um, announced results from a phase 2-3 trial showing a favorable safety profile and robust neutralizing antibody responses in children 5 to 11 years of age using a two-dose regimen of 10 micrograms administered 21 days apart, a smaller dose than the 30 microgram that's currently being used in people 12 and older. So, all right, so that's the headline. But what what was the, what was the data? Um, we don't have it all. It's not peer-reviewed. We're going to get more coming. But in this trial, um, they reported data from 2,268 participants um, age 5 to 11 years of age. And they reported that the SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing antibody geometric mean titer was 1,197.6 um, one month after the first dose um, in this group compared to 1,146.5 um, from participants aged 16 to 25 um, who had gotten the 30 microgram. 
uh, that was the control group. So really, you're getting about the same, you know, confidence interval overlap. Uh, really, you know, the median, the mean there, geometric mean is actually a hair higher. So um, the the point here, and I think I we need to talk about this a little, is this is exciting news. You're seeing this robust response. You're seeing that a smaller dose can be used. So don't just go out and use the 30 microgram dose off label. Um, Pfizer's in preparation um, to go ahead and uh, make these smaller doses. Um, they're going to new production challenges to make this happen. Um, for the United States, the companies expect to include this data in a near-term submission for EUA. Um, as they continue continue to accumulate safety and efficacy data. Um, but a couple things, and I'm sure this will be a discussion, this is a 2,268, so we say safety data, that's a small number of individuals. As this rolls out in the first four um, to eight weeks, we're going to get what we call phase four data where we have post-marketing. Um, so, you know, there will be some parents, I'm sure, that will want to wait a few extra weeks. Um, and this is going to be sort of that balance between what we're seeing now with, you know, two quarter million individuals here in the U.S. alone getting infected, thousands in the hospital. Parents will want to weigh that risk benefit during the first four to eight weeks as we get even more safety data on this age group. Daniel, how do you figure out 10 micrograms? And it's from going from 11 to 12 years, it seems like a sharp cut. How does that work? <laughs> yes. Um, no, I still I still remember, right? Like, you know, Bar Barnaby um, turned 16, you know, just like he, he was going to almost qualify. And then they, they dropped the EUA for younger ages. So we were looking at Barnaby, you know, 15 years and nine months, and he didn't qualify for the vaccine, um, but magically in three months. So um, yeah. And then, you know, on the bottom end here, um, you know, what about those those younger children? What about children who are two, three and four? Right. So you're you're four years, you're 11 months, um, you know, maybe you're you're large for your age. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. this th these cutoffs are not uh, exact science. Uh, so, um, yeah. But, do, but presumably they have some experience on dosing for different ages. And so they use that to calculate 10 micrograms, I suppose, right? Well, you, you know, with the mRNA vaccines, we don't have quite as much experience as we would like, right? So yeah. the, the amount of mRNA in the Moderna vaccine is, is three times more. Yeah. Um, and maybe that will turn out to be relevant in some things that we yeah. discussed later. Okay. All right. Um, now we move to that pre-exposure transmission testing period. I like to say never miss an opportunity to test. To test, And remember, masks are cool. Um, it appears um, that people are finally catching on. And rapid tests, like monoclonals, are now um, in short supply. Rapid tests are finally being embraced. And we have over-the-counter tests. But now you're searching everywhere to try to find them um, because they're being sold out across the country. Um, so I think this reinforces a message that, um, Vincent, I'm going to thank you for getting Michael Minna on to sort of spread this early on, is rapid tests are a really excellent public health tool. And in that two days before symptom onset, in that three to five days afterwards, um, these are incredibly sensitive and rapid ways of detecting people who are contagious, detecting people who are acutely ill. Um, if you need to repeat that test the next day, um, we're talking about tests that cost 5 to $10 here in the U.S. per test, um, where results are back in 15 minutes versus results that take um, some areas of the country, talking to a colleague in Oregon, where it's about four days in some places to get that result back. Um, exciting in this area, we heard that part of the $2 billion um, testing plan from the White House involves um, buying 647 million over-the-counter rapid tests to help subsidize these, to help get them out so we can actually get those results. All right, active vaccination. Never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. And I was listening to a little bit of the United Nations um, and uh, vaccination is how this pandemic ends is actually a theme. So uh, I think they've been listening to TWIV. Um, so let's talk a little bit about vaccines, the jabs that keep you from getting sick. Um, and a couple things, and the first will be boosters. 
um, Friday, September 17th, the FDA advisory panel met, and it was very interesting. Um, I think what was interesting was sort of like the live stream media coverage. Um, you know, here was a discussion, you know, started off with a first vote, moved on to another vote, um, and the whole time sort of the I think people were on the edge of their seat waiting for the different updates and it, it got messy at times. There were words used that I don't use in my house and that we don't allow our children to use. Um, <laughs> but um, I thought it was a really healthy discussion. And a big thing that came out of this was this reassuring, um, the sky is not falling. Um, there was some certain information that led um, to some of their recommendations. And then on Wednesday, um, the 22nd of this um, September 2021, um, we heard that following this advisory board discussion and vote that the FDA authorized booster dose of Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine for certain populations. Um, and so the US FDA amended the emergency use authorization, the EUA, for the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine um, to allow for a single booster dose to be administered at least six months after the completion of the primary series in these three categories, individuals 65 years of age or older, individuals 18 through 64 years of age at high risk of severe COVID-19, and individuals 18 through 64 years of age whose frequent institutional or occupational exposure to SARS-CoV-2 puts them at high risk of serious complications of COVID-19, including severe COVID-19. Um, and this authorization for clarity only applies to Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to pull you in on this, Vincent. But um, what basically came out of this was really a public health decision. Um, it was a risk benefit. Um, it was very clear on Friday um, from the discussion that all the data that these individuals want is not yet available. It's not um, yet been available long enough for them to really go through it. Um, so this was one of those public health decisions where it seemed reasonable and appropriate to extend the EUA. Um, but the initial idea that everyone, you know, 18, 19, 20-year-olds should be getting third doses um, did not make sense, was not recommended by that advisory committee. Um, in the in the coming weeks, we're going to learn more. We're going to learn a lot about you know when and who might um, get that second shot. We're also going to learn: is this just a Pfizer specific? Is is Pfizer now the three and you're done vaccine? Um, will Pfizer require in the future yearly boosters? Um, and then what is the situation with Moderna and J and J? And don't worry, we have some exciting data on J and J to follow. So, Vincent, I don't know if you had any thoughts. Uh, so, this is just for people who previously received Pfizer, correct? People who previously got two shots of Pfizer yeah. and now a third shot. So, if you really think the science tells you to have a third shot, you have to make it everybody, not just Pfizer. You have to make it Moderna, too, even though uh, they didn't apply for it. So... I don't, I don't, as I've said before, I don't see the data. If uh, if I were eligible, I wouldn't take it because I don't <laughs> think you need it. And I think that, uh, as we discussed last time, that paper, that opinion paper in the Lancet, really laid it all out. The science doesn't say you need it yet. Yeah, you know, and the science will come. And what we're also going to see, and this also I, I think is similar, so echo what I talked about early on, is um, we are now seeing uh, a number of individuals. We already know a number of individuals went ahead and get that got that third shot. So we're going to see in, in coming weeks here, um, a large number, millions of individuals who got for Pfizer will now get a third. Um, the suggestion is that the reactogenicity is even lower with that third shot. We'll see more safety signal. We'll get a little more of our data. Um, and then, yeah, coming co recommendations coming soon. Here, I think, is a, I think a really important thing. I want to discuss vaccines and pregnant women. And I think it's really incumbent on physicians to be um, very up to date on um, the data. And um, I know there's this, I'm going to say false dichotomy out there, the idea that people who are unvaccinated are somehow, um, I don't know, bad people, anti-vaxxers. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about the fact that um, 
over 80% of pregnant um, individuals in the United States are not vaccinated. I'm going to talk a little bit about these are actually, you know, intelligent individuals who, who are trying to make the right choice for themselves, for their unborn baby, and talk a little bit about what is the information we have. Um, I think uh, people may remember this initially started off focused on uh, physicians, um, but I think this has expanded beyond that. But here again, I want to focus on physicians to have this information, um, but also all of our listeners have the information about um, COVID vaccines in pregnancy so that these decisions can be the informed one, the right one for that pregnant woman, the right one for that unborn child. So on clinical update 59, I discussed the New England Journal of Medicine article, Preliminary Findings of mRNA COVID-19 Vaccine Safety in Pregnant Persons, where the authors reported on 35,691 V-safe participants, 16 to 54 years of age, identified as pregnant, and found no safety signals, no fertility issues, no miscarriage issues, um, et cetera. So very, very safe. In clinical update number 78, we continued this um, this thread, and we discussed the article, Characteristics and Outcomes of Women with COVID-19 Giving Birth at U.S. Academic Centers During the COVID-19 Pandemic. This is the, we're moving from safe to are these individuals at higher risk? Um, and this was the study that found that um, pregnant women pregnant people with COVID-19 were more likely to have a preterm birth, right? 16.4% versus 11.5. So a 5% higher risk of a preterm birth, significantly higher rates of ICU admission over five times as likely. Um, the odds of requiring mechanical um, ventilation, intubation were increased more than 14 fold. And a pregnant woman admitted to the hospital was 15 times more likely to die. So a pregnant woman who gets infected with COVID-19 is at very high risk. Um, and you can imagine that this risk translates into bad outcomes for the unborn child, particularly as you can imagine when that um, pregnant woman um, might die. Um, so we've established safety, We've talked about how this is a high-risk population, but the safety data continues. Um, the CDC has a special V-safe COVID-19 vaccine uh, pregnancy registry website. Um, they update this regularly. It was updated the last on the 14th of this month. Um, and as of 9-13, the day before they updated, 158,465 pregnant women were registered um, in the V-safe after vaccination health checker. Um, and they are reporting there is currently, there's still no evidence that any of the vaccines, um, including COVID-19 vaccines, cause fertility or any other problems in this population. On the risk side, unfortunately, though, here we have seen over 100,000 pregnant people infected, um, and over 100 of these women have actually died of COVID-19. What about taking it a step further? Not only are pregnant women themselves at risk, um, not only are these vaccines safe, but is this a chance to protect two people? What happens when that baby is born and the mother makes that decision to get vaccinated during pregnancy? Because um, a lot of times, and I understand this, this discussion, I understand the logic, and I'm going to challenge it, the idea of why don't you just wait until you're done with your pregnancy and then get vaccinated? I'm going to discuss here an article where it says, please get vaccinated before you have that child to give that child an extra bit of protection. So this week, the research letter, high antibody levels in cord blood from pregnant women vaccinated against COVID-19 was published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, here, as I mentioned in the U.S., only about 16% of pregnant women have been vaccinated despite this really compelling evidence, evidence. So here, what they did is they looked at umbilical cord blood. This is a way to assess our babies of women vaccinated while pregnant being born with that, that protection, um, that high level of, of spike antibodies. And in this study of umbilical cord blood, um, collected from 36 deliveries, 36 neonates, 100% studied, were positive for the anti-spike IgG at high titers. Um, among the 36 samples, 31 were also tested for um, anti-nucleocapsid. Um, these were all negative. So these are vaccinated women. These are women that were not infected, 
who, because they were vaccinated during pregnancy, were able to pass on that protection to their children, um, where we would expect that protection to last at least four months. So if you're pregnant, get vaccinated. Uh, protects you and your child. Now, what about which vaccine is best? Um, I, I, I like that now, you know, I've been talking about the T-shirts. You're going to be on the different teams. I'm on team Spikevax or Moderna here. Um, and so you might get a little bias here as I discuss this comparing comparative effectiveness of Moderna, Pfizer, BioNTech, and Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccines in preventing COVID-19 hospitalizations among adults without immunocompromising conditions, United States, March to August 2021. Uh, this came out as an early release in the MMWR. Um, it actually spoke um, to Sarah Toy at the Wall Street Journal about this. Um, and this study was looking at vaccine um, effectiveness against COVID-19 hospitalization. And I, I feel like whenever you say vaccine effectiveness, you have to add against what. Um, this looked at adults aged greater than 18 um, or older um, without an immunocompromised condition, immunocompromising condition, admitted to 21 hospitals within the influenza and other viruses in the acutely ill, the IV network. Um, this is a case control um, prospective analysis. Um, the case patients were admitted to the hospital um, with COVID-19, um, uh, PCR confirmed or an antigen test. The control patients um, had a viral illness, but they had a negative test. Um, 3,689 patients were included. So we have 1,682 case patients, 2,007 control patients. And what did they report? Um, the over, overall um, vaccine efficiency, right? And we're talking about vaccine efficacy for preventing um, hospitalization. So overall, 2,362 patients um, were unvaccinated, 476, so 12.9% were fully vaccinated with one of these vaccines. So remember the, the numbers there. Um, so 476 were fully vaccinated with the Moderna vaccine, 738 were fully vaccinated with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and 113 were fully vaccinated with the Janssen vaccine as a one dose. The vaccine efficacy against COVID-19 hospitalizations was higher for the Moderna vaccine, saying 93%, uh, the Pfizer-BioNTech 88%, um, and then the vaccine efficacy for both vaccines was higher than the Janssen. Um, I think there's a couple takeaways from here. If you're on team Moderna versus Pfizer, you can claim to have one. Another takeaway is to say that the vaccines continued had to have very high efficacy over this period of time. Um, and what were those sort of periods of time? So Moderna, say 93% for the full surveillance period with 93 in the first 120 days, dropping, I like to say dropping to 92. It's not like dropping from 93 to 92, holding above 90 at greater than 120 days. Um, the full surveillance for Pfizer was 88, starting off at 91. And there is, they say, a drop to 77. Um, but there's wide confidence intervals here, 67 to 84. Um, and then you look at Janssen, and we're going to get to Janssen. Janssen, over this period of time, in this one study, they're reporting um, 71% over time. So it's interesting that now, you know, and maybe this helps people get excited about vaccines and people like to have choices. Um, I think you can take this in several ways, but one way you may take it is what about J and J? Maybe J and J is not just one and done. So this next section goes out to all the redheads in the audience. Um, this is, and by redheads, I mean people that got J and J vaccine. Um, because my red-headed son got the Pfizer shots. Um, and and I don't know, that was an expression that my grandmother, I think I got from my Irish grandmother, is the, you know, whenever someone was left out, it was, oh, you, my poor red-headed stepson, right? Um, I've got to figure out the history of that expression. But we have a bit about J&J. &J. Um, so this starts off with... Johnson & Johnson's single-shot vaccine showed strong and long-lasting protection in the real world. Um, this is a, comes out of a preprint effectiveness of the single-dose AD26 COV2S COVID vaccine. Um, and what was this data, which is posted as a preprint? Among 390,000 
1,517 vaccinated and 1.52453 matched unvaccinated individuals. So this is huge, right? About half a million compared to one and a half million matched unvaccinated individuals. They're reporting here in this preprint, vaccine efficacy was 79%. Um, for a recognized COVID-19 infection, right? Vaccine efficacy against infection and 81% for a COVID-19 related hospitalization. They reported that this was stable over calendar time. Um, and they also looked at states with a high Delta incidence um, and saw that this was, um, that this was um, holding for them as well. Um, so, when you, when you grab your numbers, I think it's important to see there's points in a line. This, this looks good. Um, these data were consistent with the phase three um, ensemble trial um, where they were shown that there was strong, strong protection against severe critical disease. Um, but what about boosters? Maybe J&J &J is not the one and done. Maybe J&J &J is the two and done. So what about a booster shot for folks with J&J? &J? Um, so here, the announcement, um, and at this point, um, this is press release level um, from J and J. Booster shot at two months, they report provided ninety four percent protection against COVID nineteen in the U.S. Um, and this is the phase three ensemble two study, um, looking at getting another shot of the Johnson and Johnson COVID nineteen vaccine fifty six days after the first. Um, and so they say, and actually I have to say, someone asked me this at work, they say 100% protection. Um, but the confidence interval is 33 to 100. So that's a wide confidence interval against severe critical COVID-19, at least 14 days post-final vaccination. 75% protection against symptomatic, um, moderate to severe COVID-19. This is looking at a global data set, but confidence intervals 55 to 87, 94% protection against symptomatic uh, moderate to severe COVID-19 in the US. And again, wide confidence intervals, 58 to 100. And then they throw a second little bit of data when a booster um, was given at six months. So booster shot at six months provided 12-fold increase in antibodies. Um, here they're reporting that a booster of J&J &J given six months after the single shot um, compared to that second, that, that two months afterwards, gives you this extra 12-fold increase in antibodies. These rises were irrespective of age. Um, so we're getting, we're getting a little more information. I know people feel like, oh my gosh, I got the J&J. &J. How come nobody's talking about me? How come... And it's over 10 million people got J&J &J here in the U.S. alone. Um, so we're getting more data. And I would not be surprised if the J&J &J becomes the two shots and you're done instead of the one and you're done. Vincent, any thoughts on all that data? So last week we, we did a paper which uh, showed lower uh, efficacy for J&J. &J, and Rich Condit said, I bet a boost is what J&J &J <laughs> needs. And there you go. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, he may be right. Yeah, it is interesting. And and J and J is a tough vaccine when you look at antibody levels because you know if you compare the antibody levels elicited by the mRNA vaccines and the J and J vaccines, it's actually two different worlds. Um, I think you know you're you're ending up with uh, geometric means in the thousands for Moderna and Pfizer. You're ending up with a geometric mean of less than a hundred for J and J. Um, but somehow J and J works. So we're thinking there may be um, there may be a, a different cellular. Um, aspect to the protection given from J and J, which again comes back to the issue as people talk about boosters. If someone, you know, if there is, turns out there's waning immunity with the Pfizer uh, vaccine, should that third dose um, be Pfizer? Should it be J and J? Should it be Moderna? Um, I don't see that data quickly coming because you know Pfizer is going to study Pfizer, Moderna is going to study Moderna, J and J is going to study J and J. There will only be small bits of information about heterologous or mix and match out there. All right, passive vaccination. Um, the theme today is everyone seems to have found out um, monoclonals um, are really in demand. Here we're talking about passive vaccination, so pre-exposure. Um, so this, or I guess pre-positive viral test, so post-exposure prophylaxis. And the EUA, the Emergency Use Authorization, um, was expanded for Eli Lilly's cocktail, the bamlanivimab, atesivimab. Um, 
And now that has an EUA expansion to include post-exposure prophylaxis. Um, people probably need to know a little bit about what, what I'm talking about here. So um, these neutralizing antibodies can be used as a cocktail to treat high-risk individuals 12 years of age and older who have either not been fully vaccinated or are not expected to mount an adequate immune response to complete vaccination and have been exposed to someone infected with SARS-CoV-2 um, or who are at high risk of exposure in an institutional setting such as a nursing home or prison. Um, and we talked about how Regeneron Cove also has this indication. So this is that taking that history. Okay, you're here, you're testing positive, maybe you're here to get your monoclonals, um, but you have that 78-year-old husband at home with COPD um, and diabetes and maybe a little more weight than they should have, they can come in. If the test is positive, you treat them. If the test is negative and they're having this exposure, you also treat them. Um, and really excellent data supporting this. Um, but people may be asking, I thought we weren't doing Eli Lilly cocktails anymore. I thought that they stopped using these with that beta variant, with that, that E484K, Dr. Griffin. I don't know how many people are thinking that, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, the nice thing about the Delta variant is that when they have looked at this and they actually have data now in the EUA, authentic SARS-CoV-2 neutralizing data for bamlanivimab and atezomab together, um, there is no change in the fold reduction in susceptibility with with Delta. With beta, it was greater than 325. So this cocktail does not work against beta. It does work against Delta. Um, but do we have now enough data to go ahead and start using this widely as post-exposure prophylaxis? This is the UG moment, as people now know, um, now that everyone is excited about monoclonals, now that we have over 100,000 new cases a day, um, we've actually started um, rationing um, monoclonals around the country. Um, and there's actually a website, um, the phe.gov, where you can look and you can actually see how, how many doses is my state going to get um, for a particular week. We're only getting about 5,000 doses for all of New York State each week. Um, so really not enough to meet the demand for everyone who can potentially benefit from this. All right the period of detectable viral replication, that viral symptom phase. Um, as I've been saying for a while, the time for monitoring and monoclonals, not the time for antibiotics, not the time for steroids. Um, we can do harm with steroids. We can do harm and are not being helpful when we give people antibiotics here. Um, but we did get what I thought was an interesting press release from Gilead. Um, and this was... Um, Vecloray. Anyone know what that is? Remdesivir. I'm going to replace remdesivir in this press release. Remdesivir significantly reduced risk of hospitalization in high-risk patients with COVID-19. Um, this data is going to be presented in detail at ID Week, which starts next week. I'm going to be doing a presentation. Um, this data is from a phase three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial to, to evaluate the efficacy and safety of a three-day course of remdesivir um, for intravenous use for the treatment of COVID-19 in non-hospitalized patients at high risk for disease progression, right? So this is, let's give remdesivir, not during that second week when they're being admitted for an early inflammatory process, let's give it in that first week during the viral phase. And in an analysis of 562 participants randomly assigned in a one-to-one -one ratio to receive remdesivir or placebo, remdesivir demonstrated a statistically significant 87% reduction in risk for the composite primary endpoint of related hospitalization or all-cause death. Um, there were no deaths. So this is really, you know, I'm going to sort of say this is going on to end up in the hospital. Um, so the results show this 80, 81% reduction uh, for the composite secondary endpoint of medical visits at all. Um, or all-cause mortality, but again, there was no mortality in this study. So 87% reduction, 81% reduction, um, great p-values, p0.008, p0.002. Um, remdesivir early on during those first few days of illness is starting to look like the monoclonal, starting to look like an efficacious um, intervention. The challenge, of course, 
is this isn't just you come in and get that one monoclonal infusion. This is a three day. So you got to come day one, day two, day three. Um, so there's going to be a whole issue with operationalizing this. Um, there's also the issue is will the EUA expand? Um, and we are hearing that on the horizon, there may be oral drugs um, that may make this much easier to actually provide effective oral um, antivirals. All right, what if you wait till that early inflammatory phase when people get hospitalized and then you decide to give them remdesivir? I think I've related over time. I've been less than impressed. Um, and there was another um, publication in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, remdesivir plus standard of care versus standard of care alone for the treatment of patients admitted to hospital with COVID-19. So this is the Discovery study. That's sort of a catchy um, title there. Um, this is a phase three randomized controlled open label trial. Um, it's adaptive multi-center. Um, it was conducted in 48 sites in Europe. So France, Belgium, Austria, Portugal, Luxembourg. Um, and there were a number of different agents that were in this trial. So it's a one to one to one to one to one um, to receive different agents. One of those um, was the remdesivir. Um, so let's just talk about the remdesivir versus control data. No significant difference in the occurrence of serious adverse events uh, between treatment groups. Um, there were um, no noted benefit. Um, there were three deaths um, that were considered related to remdesivir by the investigators, uh, but only one by the sponsor's safety team. That was hepatorenal syndrome. Um, so really not showing any significant um, difference here. Um, so we will, we will probably be moving on, hopefully, to more exciting agents in the coming weeks. Um, but what about anticoagulation, right? This is when people end up in the hospital. We start the steroids only in individuals in that second week who have oxygen saturations less than 94. Um, we often give remdesivir, um, but anticoagulation, what dose? So I thought this was a good paper. I'm actually going to tell people to spend a little time looking at this, um, particularly if you're treating patients. Um, safety and efficacy of different prophylactic anticoagulation dosing regimens in critically and non-critically ill patients with COVID-19. A Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis of Randomized Control Trials. Um, this was published in the European Heart Journal, Cardiovascular Pharmacology, and the authors searched for randomized control trials, comparing treatment with an escalated dose, so an intermediate or therapeutic dose, versus a standard prophylactic dose, looking at critically and non-critically ill COVID patients that required hospitalization. Um, and these are individuals who weren't on anticoagulation for some other reason. This was specifically um, COVID-related. Um, the primary efficacy endpoint was all-cause death, and the primary safety endpoint was major bleeding. Um, seven randomized control trials were identified. Um, this included 5,154 patients uh, followed for an average of 33 days. And we're comparing standard dose prophylactic anticoagulation versus this escalated um, dose um, anticoagulation. Um, and this uh, was not associated with a reduction in all-cause mortality. So when you escalate it to a higher dose, we're talking 17.8 versus 18.6. So you're not getting an extra benefit, but there was um, an associated increase in major bleeding up to 2.4% from 1.4. So a relative risk of 1.73. Um, and that was confidence intervals 1.15 to 2.60. Um, so we do know that if you use higher dose anticoagulation, you will have less clots, but you will also have more bleeds. Um, and overall, you're not getting a statistically um, significant um, mortality benefit um, to doing that. So current recommendations are still prophylactic dosing across the board. Um, but what's nice about this paper is you can actually look through, you can look at the different studies. Um, again, we're at a point now when I don't think people should be just grabbing one study, even if it's published in the England Journal, you need to look at all the studies when you're trying to come up. And when I sit on the American Society of Hematology guideline panel, um, we are looking through, you know, dozens, hundreds of, of studies at this point, trying to really come up with what what does the science tell us? The science, unfortunately, is still low quality, um, I will say. And if you look through the study, you're going to see that one of the outliers is actually the REMCAP Active 4A 
a TTACC um, paper. And um, what you have to do is that was a pretty large number of individuals, 2,219. So as the potential to shift um, biases. Um, but I will, I will suggest people spend a little bit of time reading this, try to get some context on what we know and um, the decisions to be made about what level of anticoagulation. But I think it just reinforces, you know, an individual individualized assessment of the patient's risk of thrombosis and bleeding is important when deciding on anticoagulation intensity. All right. And I'm going to sort of wrap it up here with what I think is a little bit of good news. Um, no one is safe until everyone is safe. This week, the UN is in town here in New York, and we are hearing about a commitment to vaccinate the world. Um, it was announced Wednesday, um, September 21, 21, that the United States is doubling its purchase of Pfizer COVID-19 shots to share with the world, um, increasing this up to 1 billion doses. Um, and there is a goal of vaccinating at least 70% of the global population within the next year. So on that note, I'll remind everyone through the months of August, September, October, donations made to Parasites Without Borders will support floating doctors and all the great work they do down in Panama. So go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, click donate and help us and help us support them. Time for some email questions for Daniel. You can send yours to Daniel at microbe.tv. Jody writes, my cousin, a healthcare worker in Michigan who was pregnant in her third trimester, wrote to ask for thoughts on whether to get a third shot of Pfizer. Her OB is all for it but she was curious to know whether or not I had encountered any discussion or studies on the matter. I understand that pregnancy is an immunocompromised state and that pregnant women are at increased risk of developing severe symptoms. But I also remember learning that fever during a pregnancy can be harmful to the developing baby and she could experience fever as a side effect after receiving the shot. Can you shed any light on this issue for us? Yeah, no, this is this is a great question. And and I think that, you know, one of the things about the meeting that was had on Friday and the decision was made this week is they're not saying don't give um, boosters. Um, Pfizer is a licensed vaccine. They're saying have this discussion with your provider. Um, and so I'm going to encourage um, this individual to do that. Um, so I'm going to speak more broadly on this topic. First off, um, kudos. You're in the 16% the of pregnant women that have already gotten your two doses. I think that's fantastic. Um, and that really, you know, the data would really say that that's the wise decision for her and her baby. But the third dose, um, you know, one of the big things that came out um, in the studies uh, that were discussed last Friday was that individuals under the age of 40, under the age of 50, really continue to have really excellent protection. There's no compelling data that um, everyone across the board needs that third dose. We certainly have no compelling data that that third dose needs to be given across the board to pregnant women. Um, so as a general, I will say the science does not necessarily um, push one to go forward with that third dose during pregnancy. And this would be one of those issues. We really are careful with vaccines. We really want to know the safety profile before we encourage people to do that. Um, and right now we have great safety data on the two shots in pregnancy. We don't have the safety data on giving another dose. So um, have that conversation with the physician, get all the facts, make an informed decision. Marcy writes, question about masks. Have you seen the singing masks? And what do you think of them for singing in a choir? All vaccinated, standing six feet apart in a very large open room, a church outdoors for part of rehearsal. Would face shields add anything? Uh, this is, so I have not. I am not familiar with the singing, <laughs> the singing mask. Uh, Vincent, are you familiar with the singing mask? No. I'm yeah, not I'm seen not familiar it. with that. Uh, but no, I mean, this is this is a creative, it, it sounds very creative. I don't know what the data is on it, but it'd be interesting to see. Uh, because yeah, people want to do the activities um, uh, that they enjoy. Um, sometimes the singing is just singing because they they love singing. I think there are some singers on in the TWIV uh, co-hosts. Um, there are also some people that enjoy playing instruments. I'm a flute player, by the way, because people didn't know that. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how I can play a flute if I have to convert over to something made out of silver or copper. I don't have enough money to buy a silver flute. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, th this sounds great and interesting. I'll have to look into that. Yeah, they look like masks with an extended front, right? With some kind of structure instead of sitting up against your face. So oh, oh. take a look. Yeah, it might make sense. Mike writes, trying to convince my 23-year-old daughter to get vaccinated. She's hesitant. 
I think this is common in our age group. Not sure I can change your mind. I'm trying to point to some credible large-scale data showing the efficacy, which I define as reduction in hospitalization, long COVID, and death. The vaccines are all presented as having impressive 90% efficacy numbers. Tried to read the paper you mentioned in number 800, risk factors and disease profile of post-vaccination infection in UK users of the COVID symptom study app. They reported 0.5% of the one dose vaccinated sub subsequently caught COVID, 0.2% of the two dose, but I did not see the number of unvaccinated people in these data. Surely the number of cases in the UK unvaccinated population is known over the same period. Yeah, so th this is, this is I think, a really important conversation that you're having, so keep having that conversation. Um, the, the first thing you do is, is ask your daughter, listen, find out what's going on. Um, you know, I've had several conversations and people always apologize. I'm sorry, Dr. Griffin, I have a question. I know you're so busy and I, I'm never too busy to talk about, um, vaccines. Um, the, what are the, what are the risks? What are people worried about in their early twenties? I was talking to one of our, um, case managers today who has a 25, 24 year old daughter, right? So very close to 23, 24, um, sometimes actually telling stories, um, that, that have been shared with you or, or, or that you've talk to the person individually. And, and the story was here, her 24 year old daughter got COVID, um, and is still continuing to have this, this chest pain that wakes her up from night. Um, we have individuals have loss of smell. We have individuals where they lose their hair. We have individuals with long COVID and all those issues. Most, um, most people in their 20s are, in their heads, immortal, so they're not going to die. So the risk of death to them um, is not particularly persuasive. Ending up in the hospital is not really part of their worldview. Um, but a lot of the other things we've learned about COVID is this young um, group, particularly it looks like women more than men, are at higher risk of a post-acute sequelae of COVID, um, lingering long-term issues, um, teeth have fallen out, hair has fallen out, fatigue, um, low energy, cognitive dysfunction, which we're now calling it instead of brain fog, to recognize just how profound that can be, um, the inability to exercise at the level where they could before. Um, so I think it's important to share and talk about these. How long will those things last? To be completely honest, we only have about two years of data. Um, so you could throw that in there. You may only feel crummy for one or two years. Um, where we know the safety profile of the vaccines, um, incredibly safe, much lower risk of having any problem by getting vaccinated compared to all we've learned about this horrible virus. Uh, Robert writes, Dr. Griffin says he likes to emphasize to people that COVID is not a two week disease. The situation is more complicated than just getting COVID, being sick for a couple of weeks and then getting better or not. If this is in fact the case, why is it that long COVID seems to be understood by the medical community as a sequela to COVID-19? I think Dr. Griffin calls it a subset of PACs rather than part of the acute disease process. Is the distinction meaningful or just semantic? Also, we've only had slightly less than two years experience. This doesn't sound long to me, but then I'm 73. <laughs> Yes. I, one day in my 70s, I will have that wisdom and patience that it sounds like you have developed. Um, yeah, we, we only have a, a certain period of time. So what, what are we talking about? And so um, when the NIH got together and they, they tried to define what was going on, they came up with this, this term. PASC or PASC, post-acute sequelae of COVID. And, and what they were realizing, um, and a colleague of mine, Sarah Dotty, published a paper um, with uh, Ken Cohen and some others at United Health Group looking at individuals that got COVID, what happened to them over the next year. And we were seeing twice the, twice the incidence of new diagnosis of diabetes, uh, five-fold increased risk of stroke, things like that. So we started to realize that there were a lot of sequelae, a lot of things that were happening to these individuals after COVID infection that weren't just what were being described in these support groups. So it's sort of a larger umbrella to understand what's going on. As a subset, we have individuals with this syndrome where they have fatigue, where they have cognitive dysfunction, where they have a chest pain, where they have um, 
headaches, new onset headaches that they've never had before. A number of these other things that we sort of put together. Um, and what we basically, you know, it, it is meaningful for us as clinicians, but I think it's also meaningful for us um, living in this society that there are individuals at four weeks who are not better. There's individuals at eight weeks who are not better. We now have individuals who got sick in March of 2020 who still are not well enough to return to their, their pre-illness employment. Um, and a lot of our large employers are telling us that's still about 10% of their workforce. So I think this is really important, um, and I think it is meaningful. Um, will at some point these people get better? Some of them are getting better. That's true. By the time you get about one year out, um, a a significant percent of these people have either improved or, or gotten better. But unfortunately, there's a residual, a fairly large residual that have continued to suffer even, you know, 12 months, 18 months out. So Robert points out that I said on a recent podcast, there's no long polio, but he says there is post polio, where years after recovering from polio and regaining limb function, you start to lose it again. And so he, he points out that is what I think of as a sequelae, right? It happens, but it's not really long polio because you don't have a continuous set of symptoms as you do with, with COVID. I mean, I know it's a distinction, but I think it's actually clinically different, don't you think? Yeah, and I think that's an important distinction um, that, that you make. Um, and I, I was not that familiar in my training with post-polio syndrome until I went out to Colorado and I was working in an area that had been really hard hit with polio. Um, and so I was taking care of a lot of individuals who were in their 50s, 60s um, and older who were on walkers who basically said, you know, they had polio when they were younger. They thought they made a complete recovery. But then when they got into their 50s, they had apparently lost enough reserve that they, you know, they needed a walker, which I'm in my 50s. And so if I was needing a walker in my 50s, I would be quite shocked. So that is one of the things we worry about, um, you know, long term. What, what's going to happen? We know with COVID now, you know, months, 18 months out what's going to happen, you know, two, three, five years. Um, I do not expect it to be anything like the horrors of the post-polio syndrome that we saw, but boy, there are plenty of horrors that we're seeing now. Well, for any viral disease, you can often think of long-term consequences. For example, West Nile neurological infection, they, you know, you have cognitive and motor problems. Um, even mumps can have long-term, in, in some boys, it would sterilize them, right? So yeah, yeah. The, there's, but it's not a continuous spectrum. Long COVID, I think, is different because as you say, it just doesn't stop. Right? Yeah, I would agree. That is COVID-19 clinical update number 81 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone be safe. <laughs>